I'm taking a holiday from crime fighting in Gotham City. No rest from danger, though, because all around us is that deadly daily danger traffic. <laughs> Ah yes, the automobile. A symbol of human innovation, a mode of immense practicality and increasing production, a humble reflection of our ever-changing, ever-growing global landscape, and a ubiquitous reminder of how far we've come as a species to achieving the impossible. But let's get real for a second. In a day and age of persistent media saturation, glamorization, and a culture consumed by its own ego, it's fair to say that vehicles have also become this fierce symbol of bravado. They're like a powerful dick measuring contest to the point that we've romanticized bikes and automobiles as having their own distinct personalities and human characteristics, as if they're so ubiquitous to the point that they're essentially one of us now. Do you wish further information on Silicon Valley? Hell no, I wanna know who you are and how you're listening in. And don't get me wrong, I totally get why people take such excessive pride and joy in their vehicles because obvious practicalities, financials and well, general admiration for aesthetic and engineering aside, many of us see them as an extension to our identity and lifestyle, or at the very least, it's something we find a sincere personal connection with. In worst cases, however, some treat their vehicles like a real-world equivalent to an anonymous internet troll, cruising the streets, blasting their obnoxious music, and revving their engine with such orgasmic smugness just to be an attention-seeking pin in the hole. Everybody's checking us out. Yeah, they think we're pretty cool. Listen, I appreciate you love your pussy wagon so much, but the rest of us yeah, don't really care. I sleep in a racing car, do you? I sleep in a big bed with my wife. Oh. Believe it or not, this mentality of seeing our car or bike as an extension of our character all started around the post-Second World War era. After coming out of an economic slump where manufacturing could now expand beyond the war effort and look to revolutionizing the automobile as something more than simply getting us from A to B, there was a greater desire for aesthetic and speed and other technical shit I don't care nor wish to understand. All I know is car goes vroom vroom and suddenly I'm selling my organs to pay for the insurance. So naturally as demand surmounted and competition increased, so came the fears of imperfect engineering and technology on top of the already imperfect creatures that operate such death machines, which to be fair are nowhere near as deadly as they used to be. However, when it comes to people, yeah, that's still open to debate. As longtime fans know, I am a sucker for domestic horror and its prevalence during the 70s and 80s slasher era, where themes of stranger danger, home invasion, and random acts of violence tapped into a genuine social hysteria. Yet, we tend to forget that the slasher genre extended beyond simply a maniac with a knife, and some filmmakers opted to give the killer a vehicle instead, bringing the true terrors of road accidents and vehicular danger to the forefront. So with that in mind, let's switch on the ignition and talk about the untold history of killer car movies. Just before we begin, a niche topic like this is made possible thanks to this week's sponsor, Spotlight Oral Care. I know, isn't this exciting? Spotlight Oral Care are a cruelty-free, vegan-friendly dental alternative to your typical supermarket oral care, and offer a wide range of products free from harmful ingredients, such as toothpastes, whitening systems, and specifically this slick-looking sonic toothbrush that's gradually helping me overcome my paranoia about my teeth. I specifically chose this sponsor because, as a child who ate way too many sweets and as an adult who drinks way too much coffee, a sonic toothbrush brings a certain level of precision when it comes to removing plaque and discoloration to my very sensitive teeth, and I've genuinely noticed the difference since I started using it over the previous stuff that I owned. It has a 2 minute self timer so you don't overbrush, 3 speed settings including a sensitive one for people like me, a 70 day battery life which is great because I always forgot to charge my old brush, and it comes with this cool protective travel case which will come in handy when I'm eventually able to travel again. 
Spotlight even sent me teeth whitening strips, which is something I've never done before, but I've certainly noticed a fair difference over the week I've been using them. So if you want to improve your dental hygiene, ease sensitivity, and just want a sexy looking sonic toothbrush that'll make you the cool kid at the party, you can join the Spotlight community and get 25% off your first order by clicking the link below and using my code. And while you're at it, let's talk about some killer car movies. So just a heads up, anything and everything involving a killer automobile is free reign for spoiling here, but then again, there really isn't that much to spoil considering most of, if not all of these examples, essentially followed the exact same formula where a mysterious driver terrorizes innocent people just going about their everyday life, only to end with the villain getting their comeuppance, usually in the form of their vehicle flying off a cliff into a ball of fleams or something of that nature. The movie where death is in the driver's seat. However, if you've seen my video on killer spider movies, you'll know this isn't exactly a traditional history lesson. And while killer motor movies have always existed in some capacity, you could say the ones I'm referring to are defined by two concepts. Movies about a mysterious evil driver, and movies about vehicles with a mind of their own. Yet regardless, both concepts have one thing in common. The vehicle itself is inherent the villain. The barrier between life and death is no greater than the thickness of a door. And now, the door is open. I guess what I kinda hope you get out of this is an understanding that despite these films being labelled as pure schlock or sensationalist fear-mongering thrillers, many of them had genuinely thoughtful thematic links to real-world horrors that ended up taking a backseat to more conventional mainstream slasher flicks at the time about home invasions and so on. Oh, and uh, please don't get angry at me if I don't mention a certain flick you're familiar with, because I had to watch dozens of these films for research, and by the end, I was ready to drive my own car off a fucking cliff, so bear with me here. Our story begins in 1971. Hollywood had just entered the dark era of cinema brought on by societal unrest towards increasing domestic crime and violence, and the fear of the automobile fell into the hands of an ambitious unknown director looking to establish his name in the game called Steven Spielberg. While not technically his first feature film, Spielberg's studio debut Jewel introduced the world to the terror of being relentlessly pursued by a massive speeding truck operated by a mysterious driver without a clear motivation, pulling us into an intense cat and mouse chase through the Nevada desert where things just get progressively deadlier. Despite being the first of its kind, Jewel is still arguably the ultimate example of the subgenre, given practically every subsequent film copied its exact template without much deviation. In fact, the open road desert country setting remained predominantly unchanged because it naturally escalated the feeling of helplessness and loneliness in a wilderness where anything could happen. While inherently a slasher in formality, a lot of these earlier movies actually borrowed a lot of their technique and style from westerns, with the use of standoff intercutting tension, maison-scene, a sense of lawlessness, and I guess treating vehicles as these modernized mechanical wild animals. But the major takeaway from Jewel was that it was one of the early pioneers of having a killer without a motive. While it's certainly commonplace today, back then it was seen as quite provocative to lack motive or any sense of reason in traditional storytelling. As such, it transforms the film from simply this powerful minimalist thriller into an adrenaline fueled psychological nightmare where we spend a fair bit of time in the head of our sole protagonist David as he tries to figure out how the hell he managed to piss off the truck driver, even going as far as trying to confront him in person, but ultimately never finding out who it is. 
In I Am Legend writer Richard Matheson's original script, based on his short story for Playboy magazine about his real experience being aggressively tailgated by a truck driver, it very explicitly avoids giving the driver an identity, with Spielberg only showing us a few minor glimpses of the character. In Spielberg's perspective, that's what propels the horror. We go past drivers every day and it only takes one lunatic to mount the curb and easily kill us. We may have already seen our killer, we just don't know it yet. And then by not knowing the driver, the truck itself thus becomes the villain, establishing that idea of projecting personality onto our vehicles. Hell, Spielberg specifically chose a 1955 Peterbilt 281 from a vehicle audition lineup. Yes, that actually happened, because it had a menacing looking face that's only heightened by its greasy, rustic look that gives it both this unstoppable and eerie supernatural quality. A quality that was then introduced into 1974's Killdozer, where, in a sci fi twist, a meteor unleashes an alien presence that possesses a bulldozer, where very little proceeds to happen because. Uh, in execution, bulldozers aren't exactly menacing when you're able to outrun them. To be fair, Supernatural flicks became a surprising complement to the raw, gritty realism that overshadowed the 70s because they helped heighten greater metaphoric and thematic ideas thanks to the growing cultural acceptance of superstition and the unexplained. One of the more unusual examples that bridged the gap between realism and fantasy to a certain degree due to its ridiculous premise was the horror comedy The Cars Who Ate Paris. In this film, the locals of the fictional Australian town of Paris set up traps that force tourists into fatal road accidents where they proceed to pillage the victims' possessions and car parts and lobotomize survivors for experimentation. Funnily enough, it has a sort of pre-Mad Max absurdity to it where the car parts are used by the younger generation to create these bizarre death vehicles while they feud with the older generation who simply want peace. There are a few elements at play here. You've got the tangible fear of unpredictable, life-changing road accidents, and then you've got the generational divide, where the younger generation modify their cars to reflect the ego-driven obsession I talked about at the start, while the older generation cautions such recklessness to fatal results. What quickly becomes noticeable is that bravado and masculinity are the two major recurring themes in killer car movies, where it was first subtly established in Jewel, and then became the subject of scrutiny in 1979's Death Car on the Freeway. In Jewel, there's a crisis of masculinity angle introduced during the early overtaking scene that initiates the conflict of the story. Both these men push across their alpha male status by fighting for control of the road, and it becomes a fight characterised by who is the better man. It's then reinforced by how our main protagonist David is the opposite of typical male heroes from the era. He's reluctant, insecure, has doubts, is clearly stressed about something, and lacks confidence, and this all becomes reflected onto the weakness of his car in comparison to the truck, and eventually when he just stops running from his fears and fights back, he achieves that cathartic victory. It's basically a metaphor for a guy running from his problems, and then when pushed to the very literal edge, he has no choice but to confront it to overcome it. Ego is a cautionary tale in all these movies, and despite such a classic 70s title like Death Car on the Freeway, the theme brings some considerable emotional weight to it. Death Car's entire shtick is playing off media sensationalism and fear-mongering. We have this mysterious, never-seen driver who the media call, uh, British herself, the Freeway Fiddler, who stalks female drivers on a busy LA freeway, forcing them into fatal car accidents. Straight away, it has a pretty glaring emphasis on female driver cliches, as it treats all its female characters as incompetent victims where the men have to save the day, which is then challenged by our main lead, who goes after the driver in the end, to a pretty abrupt yet expected result. 
You could say it has a bit of a female empowerment angle to it, where these women are trying to fight back against a male-dominated society with a very blatant commentary on how vehicles have become weaponized and we're not doing enough to regulate the surmounting chaos of so many cars now on the roads. I do appreciate it goes for a more relatable setting away from pure country desert roads because it does somewhat ground the film in the media frenzy of the time in regards to the likes of the Zodiac Killer and so on. They even try using some psychological realism by adding the profiling methods used for Zodiac so they can determine who the killer is, but ultimately what it ends up doing is using invalid base rate information where their theories simply come down to generic guesswork like a troubled childhood or some sort of mental illness or whatever. I mean, you could apply any of these factors to anything to justify an argument. However, once we hit the 80s, this attempt at provocative, grounded realism uh, went straight out the window. While horror in the 80s was dominated primarily by stabby masked men, everything from sci-fi to supernatural to straight up creature feature were still pretty prominent on the menu, and in the case of killer car movies, trying to be a bit off everything seemed like the way to go. Of course, it ended up being Stephen King who would have the most prolific impact on the killer car scene in the 80s, with his sole directorial effort Maximum Overdrive based on his 1973 short story Trucks, sucking up all later contemporary attention despite being a commercial and critical failure. You would think I would spend a lot of time on it because it has such an incredibly enthusiastic cult following, but no. I really have nothing interesting to say about it other than it was part of the growing moral panic of technology being evil, and how our obsession with innovation would doom us all to extinction. You know, the kind of Skynet crap that's now painfully overused today. Instead, I'm going to turn your attention to the more profound 1983 adaptation of King's acclaimed killer car novel, Christine. This stellar little killer car flick by John Carpenter serves as a perfect supernatural companion piece to Spielberg's Jewel. I think this film has been wildly misinterpreted as simply a story about an evil car that kills people. I mean, yeah, that's kinda true, but it's actually more of a character study when you think about it. You have this stereotypical nerdy virgin called Arnie, who buys and repairs an old 1958 Plymouth Fury, and long before anything properly supernatural occurs, the story focuses on how obsessive Arnie becomes with the car, and just how much of a thirsty bitch he ultimately is. He's set up as relatably awkward, vulnerable and undermined by his parents and peers before he gradually transforms into this arrogant greaser who alienates himself from those closest to him. It's one of the only examples in the subgenre that's directly focused on how the vehicle influences the character, because it's not just Arnie that's obsessed with the car, the car is just as obsessed with him. Hell, it even tries to kill his girlfriend out of jealousy, so so she can have him all to herself. What makes Christine fit perfectly within the slasher genre is that it contributes to this theme of sexual promiscuity that became prevalent in the horror genre after Wes Craven brought it to our attention in Nightmare on Elm Street. Sex is perceived as this transcendent desire that's also seemingly dangerous, and cars can thus act as a dual symbol of this, in that it's a pussy magnet and a death machine all in one. She had the smell of a brand new car. That's just about the finest smell in the world. Except maybe for pussy. It goes beyond just attributing personality to the car and infers to it as having feelings, desires and objectives. I mean, Arnie and Christine literally fall in love with each other, and Christine is such a clingy petty bitch that before it actually does anything violent, you sort of come to hate it already and think that it's no good for Arnie because of how much it changes him. I mean, you know the film is doing something right when it manages to mirror a toxic relationship. Arnie is selfish and egotistical and completely disregards his girlfriend who clearly cares for him, but he only cares for the car, which is kind of like his mistress in a way because it keeps figuratively and literally driving his repressed desires and taking control of him. 
I will admit I wasn't as on board with it thematically when it switches to a pure murderous car with a mind of its own, after Stephen King's trademark psychotic bullies destroy the car and it repairs itself to allow Arnie to take revenge. I think it detracts from the initial psychological implications where all the supernatural stuff are Arnie's delusions, but then the logic takes an even swifter nosedive in the climax when, for no clear reason, the car decides to eject Arnie and kill him. It was the one issue I was left questioning. If all the previous owners died in strange freak accidents related to the car, how does it suddenly go from wanting Arnie all to itself to just tossing him out? I mean, it would make sense if he was trying to resist its control, but he doesn't. By the end, he's completely a puppet to the car, so it's just a jarring U-turn to say the least. After the 80s, it wasn't until around the turn of the 21st century did the concept of a killer car movie gradually resurface, and those that used it didn't necessarily do so to the same effect. The early 2000s saw Joyride and Jeepers Creepers kick things off with a rehash of Jewel, the former adding a more direct line of communication with the driver, while the latter taking a B-movie U-turn with its demon bat thing, which bizarrely in its more recent third entry prequel decided to turn the truck into a fucking saw trap. I have a lot of salt with that franchise so let's not get into it. Anyway, before we get to the final film that cemented the killer car subgenre, leave it to Quentin Tarantino to be the one filmmaker to celebrate this incredibly niche subject matter in the form of Death Proof, which in my opinion is the weaker part of the 70s grindhouse exploitation collaboration between him and Robert Rodriguez. Now, apparently I got quite a bit of heat for calling it self-indulgent nonsense, and I don't entirely regret that opinion, it knows exactly what it is sure, but to Tarantino standards, it's the one film of his that goes for pure homage without adding anything of its own. I guess going against typecast by having Kurt Russell be the villain driver is something, but generally speaking, it's no more creative, flashy, or interesting as any of the other films I've talked about so far. But on the polar opposite spectrum, if we're given points for outlandish and inventive concepts, I guess we have to address what is by far the most oddball, if indeed somehow deeply monotonous, 2010 indie film about a killer tire with telekinetic powers. You mean psychokinetic? Oh, what the fuck ever. Let's briefly talk about rubber. So before you all accuse me of technically cheating, I think Rubber pretty much signalled the end to the killer car subgenre. Sure, it still exists today, but Rubber more or less lampooned the entire concept and even the slasher genre as a whole. While the idea behind Rubber is a killer tire with telekinetic powers, you mean psychokinetic? All right, goddammit, the story is actually more of a weird satire meta piece about nothingness, in that the film begins by establishing a literal audience who watch the events unfold, and each of them debate their interpretation or understanding of the tire and its personality. The film you are about to see today is an homage to the no reason that most powerful element of style. It's like an auteurist writer's wet dream, where they get it, but you don't. It's filled with pretentious waffle, but it's got a zany dark sense of humour to it to stop you from feeling completely alienated. I think what it's going for is a sort of critique of the perception of film analysis like this by going so far out of its way to allude to how we try and eject so much meaning into things as innocuous as a random tire. It taps into this craving for purpose despite there clearly being none. Like the tire seems to be going through a graduate style existential crisis, and the same could be said for our main hero who eventually just anticlimactically gives up on everything and ends the film on his own terms. And bye. Conversely, the audience watching eventually die from eating a poisoned turkey, so the characters are told the movie can end and they can all go home because there's nobody watching. But since this one guy is still alive, the show must go on. It's a weird filmmaking deconstruction that's more interesting to ponder over than actually watch. But the way the film ends with this whimper of having no point and having the cycle of nothingness continue, find a bizarre way of making me feel hollow inside. As if 
if I suddenly realized that there's nothing to gain from watching these movies. That for every 90 minute killer car movie I watched, it was nothing more than a distraction from the monotony of everyday life. And the only reason I'm making a video on it is for the desire of giving my actions purpose. Oh my god, is anybody still watching? What the hell am I doing with my life? <laughs> what happened? Where am I? In all seriousness, there are an endless supply of killer car movies I could have talked about that all have something interesting to say. From Rolling Vengeance, where the killer truck is technically the good guy going after rapists and drunk drivers, I swear to god that is the plot, or The Hearse, which takes on a more traditional slasher angle of dealing with grief and mortality, similar to Dead End. The thing about killer car movies is that you can appreciate them for the schlock that they are, are, but a good number of them are genuinely thoughtful with their concepts, exploring true human fears and hysteria, and highlighting palpable issues we see every day on the roads. Along with westerns, a lot of these movies built off the exploitation genre, of biker gangs and hostile loners, and made the dangers of the automobile and the people behind the wheel more broad and relatable without being overtly bleak and nihilistic. Of all the examples I show throughout, while most of them share the same formula, I was surprised how sincere they were regardless. They're fun and thrilling without overemphasizing their politics. In a way, many horror movies have perceived the car as a beacon of safety and fortification from the horrors outside, but these temporary beacons of safety aren't always what they appear to be. It calls attention to humanity's need for diligence and responsibility because we build things designed to make up for our shortcomings as a species, no matter the cost. As an extension of the slasher movie, their job is not to simply entertain, but drive deep into how much we unquestionably take our fragility for granted. <laughs>